Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Friday forecasting talks. And today we are hosting Stefan Colossa from SAP, who is going to present on uh, forecasting retail demand, brackets including earthquakes and pandemics. So uh, over to Stefan. Can you tell me when you see my screen? I think we can see it already. Very good. Then I'll just work off the the hope that everybody else can see it too. Forecasting retail demand, including earthquakes and pandemics. So let's talk about forecasting retail demand. So why does a retailer need forecasts? And uh, I'll start out with a little war story. Um, I'm, a couple of years back, I was in beautiful Lancaster, very nice place. And I visited a convenience store, supermarket type of store in the middle of town and just walked through the aisles. It was a retail that I didn't know, a supermarket, grocery. Uh, I didn't know that one. I like walking through supermarkets when I'm away from home just to see how things work in, in different places in the world. And I started snapping pictures. And uh, yeah, was as you see, it was not entirely a satisfying uh, view in that store, tons of empty shelves. And the, the more uh, important part is that some of the empty shelves um, belong to or, or were supposed to be full with promotional products like uh, six heritage free range eggs so for only one pound. Well, right now, no, no, no such eggs because the eggs were out of stock. Later on, heritage cheese, any two for three pounds. Well, we're in luck. There's exactly two packages left. So we could pick those two packages and the next customer signing behind us will be out of luck because they won't be getting any. And other shelves made a similar impression. So, so lots, lots, lots and empty, of empty shelves. So this retailer was called My Local and they had uh, the tagline fresh, friendly, convenient and as a matter of fact, a year later, I came back to Lancaster and I thought I'd look into this, the very same store and see whether things had changed. And imagine my surprise at seeing the store closed and shuttered. I went online and found out that the and not only this store, but the entire chain of like two or 300 stores had gone out of business. And then I uh, looked around a little more and found a couple of comments that people had left on their experience in my, at my local. And it was uh, the gist was uh, empty shelves. I'm not going to go back. And I very much loved the one at the bottom right. For goodness sakes, how difficult is it to order Britain's most popular newspaper, the Daily Mirror? My dog would make a better job at being manager. So you can really you can feel the righteous fury in here. So uh, the customers were not happy. So I'm not saying that all of this, uh, all of these empty shelves were down to bad forecasts, but what I am saying, what I'm sure about is that good forecasts are necessary for full shelves, for shelves that are full enough so the customer is happy and not so full that we have to write off something at the end of the day. And need to recall, my local was not an SAP customer, so it wouldn't have happened with us. All right, so why does a retailer need forecasts? So we've seen uh, the first use case just to have uh, operational planning, store replenishment. So we need to know how much product we need to push into the stores uh, ahead of time before the demand materializes, not afterwards. But also for tons of other planning use cases like strategic planning where to open new stores or to close old ones, whether we want to add a new product line, whether we want to have an a strategic decision, uh, have, having every day low price versus promotional strategy. Those are strategic decisions. We have tactical decisions like assortment planning, allocation planning, price optimization, promotion planning, supply negotiations, log logistics. They all are forward looking planning steps and they all rely on forecasts. People may not call these forecasts forecasts. They may just use uh, last year's data and work on the basis of that. And what they're subconsciously implying is that last year's data are a good proxy for next year's sales. And so they're really forecasting in a naive way. But really, it's forecasts. It's forecasts all the way down. So what kind of time series are we dealing with? So here's one time series. Actually, it's not very representative. Uh, but it's it's going to work for now. It's a sales time series on a granularity that's stock keeping unit times store times day. So that is just one store. You see it's somewhat ancient, but I think that the principles are still apply because this is a timeless product. These are tomatoes. 
This is one particular stock keeping unit of tomatoes and the sales are in kilograms. It's a, a middle U European store. And uh, this is just one stock in keeping unit of tomatoes. Of course, there's multiple ones. If you go to your supermarket, here's your, your homework. The next time you go shopping, just look at the tomatoes and count how many different stock keeping units there are of tomatoes. You can have just the, the tomatoes as they are. They are the plain vanilla tomatoes and they can be open, so sold by weight or prepackaged. You can have the small cherry tomatoes in five different colors. You can have the medium sized tomatoes again open or packaged. You can have all of these organic or conventional. The last time I really counted was uh, I found in a single store, I found 10 different stock keeping units of tomatoes and all of them need to be forecasted and planned and replenished separately. So let's look at the time series here, what we see here. So the um, first thing is that we actually see some seasonality in here, some year over year seasonality. So years start each time we have a new year down here. So we see that there is a kind of a peak in summer and a trough in winter because people like to eat more tomatoes and tomato salads in summer. So um, what else do we see here? Well, when if we zoom into the data, and then uh, we see that there's a lot of noise at the bottom and there's higher peaks up there. And if we really just plot these data, just let's forget about all the time series aspect and just plot them by day of week. So each dot here is one day in my time series and they're just plotted by day of week and we overlay it like a little bean plot and a, a box plot and we see Sunday, no sales on Sunday, the store is closed. That is good because that makes everything a little more legible for us. And apart from that, we see a typical fish hook pattern. So, or hockey stick, it's called it hockey stick. Lower sales Monday through Thursday, higher sales on Friday, and especially on Saturday. There is, and that's kind of, kind of, that depends on the geography and on the culture. There's also places in the world where higher sales on Friday and lower sales on Saturday. But typically, the weekend sees higher sales, and so we need to account for that. And if we include that in our little model, then we see fits and forecasts that have this seasonality and that also include this day of week effect. And you see how the day of week effect, the difference between Monday and, Friday and Saturday is stronger in the high season than in the low season. And that kind of makes sense. Of course, it's partly an artifact of our model, but the model already accounts for this kind of interaction effect and it sees it in there. So kind of makes sense. We also have prices, of course. Now, tomatoes are not quite as price sensitive as other things, but we do have the prices. And as you see, the prices are kind of variable, go up and down and we see a, a scale up here. Oh, we, can, we can include these prices in our model and then we see something like this, for instance. So that could be the in sample fit and the out of sample forecast over here on the right hand side. I lost my mouse, key, my mouse pointer. Here it is. Okay. And one thing that you see there's a price change down here. Price drops down, and we actually believe we forecast that our sales will increase. So sales here in this week are higher than in the week before or in the week after, or at least our forecast is. So we're accounting for a certain price effect in here. In retail forecasting, one important thing is that there is a, an enormous amount of causal factors and most blatant ones of these are typically promotions offers. So we may have a temporary price reduction, a TPR. We may have a BOGO, buy one, get one. So you buy two products for the price of one, buy one, get one, often always called a BOGO, buy one, get one free. And then we see this cryptical abbreviation here. No, that is not a typo. That is my personal abbreviation for buy N units of product X at X percent off. You get M units of product Y at Y percent off. And yes, indeed, retailers are extremely inventive in dreaming of new promotions of this and of even weirder types. And we need to forecast them. There could be conditions tied to those promotions. You may only be able to take advantage of a promotion or an offer if you have the corresponding coupon on paper or in your app or whatever else. Or you may only be able to you to take advantage of a promotion if you're a loyalty card holder or a loyalty card holder with the appropriate status. You may get rewards in terms of not getting the product at 
X percent off, but in terms of if you buy this product, you get a coupon that you can redeem the next time you come for a completely unrelated product. Or you may get a gift card or cash back, which is very important, especially for if you buy a printer in the United States, that's very common there. Buy this printer, send in proof of purchase, you get a check back for $100. Or you may even get airline miles or bonus points on your loyalty card. There are tons of tactics, and by tactics, I mean ways of drawing your attention to the promotion that's happening. It could be, a, could be a shelf tag, a simple tag on the shelf. It could be a secondary placement at the end cap. So at the end of the aisles, there is always the, the facing size and there's the end caps. Those really draw attention. There is there's papers on which end of the aisle is more relevant, the front end or the back end. And all, every time you have these promotions, if they're conditional on something, you may still get regular sales. So if you have a, if you can take advantage of a promotion, if you carry the loyalty card, then you can still buy the product at the regular price if you don't have the loyalty card. But there, of course, there's going to be lower regular sales than offer sales because uh, then than normally because people who will buy it on regular price will now switch to offer if they can. So we have suppression effects. And those are important if we need to treat offer sales and regular sales separately and forecast them separately. We need to do that for budgetary and reporting reasons. We may have suppression effects on, yeah, so we talked about the suppression effects. We may have calendar events. Christmas is of course important, but also Chinese New Year or day of month effects. So at the beginning of the month, if you, everybody got their paychecks and people may buy more, it's a rather weak effect, but you can see it sometimes. You see holidays and their impact. And we have other things like weather, cannibalization or complementarity. If you have a promotion on steaks and you may see higher sales on steak sauces. So just an example for calendar events and we see a time series here. That's total unit sales of one particular store somewhere in the world. And we see three different calendar events marked uh, by the bars, by the vertical bars. So Christmas, of course, is the blue bars right at the beginning, at the end of the year. Yet, uh, the one that has the highest impact with a nice ramp up effect is this green line here, this vertical green line. If, if this was interactive, I'd be asking you what kind of effect that would be. And uh, when I asked this once in Lancaster with tons of Chinese students, they knew what that was. That is Chinese New Year. And this is actually a high end drugstore jewelry retailer in China in greater China. And of course, they see these ramp ups for Chinese New Year and a much smaller ramp up and effect for Christmas. Short time series are also a, a challenge in retail. So on average, there is a rough rule of thumb that a retailer will change 30% of their assortment every year. So if you want to have two years of history, so you can actually say something about year over year seasonality, you can say that well, only about 49%, namely 70% times 70%, only half your assortment will have two years of history. Of course, the tomatoes of this world will have this long history because the tomatoes don't change, but most consumer packaged goods like shampoo, yogurt, and so on and so forth, they will indeed change over time. And sometimes we're actually pretty good at forecasting. So here's just an example that we had. And of course, I filtered for some reasonable forecasts. We had like four days of sales. That's black lines in green. We have the fit and in red, we have the forecast and in black, we have the holdout sample. And actually this works pretty well. And in other cases, it does not quite work as well. All right, I promised you earthquakes. Here's the earthquakes. What does that mean? Why, is, why are earthquakes important for us? Well, as a matter of fact, this is a time series from one store in New Zealand. And New Zealand is somewhat prone to earthquakes and they had huge earthquakes in 2011, two of them, one in February, one in June. I don't know where this one came from. That's another interesting thing. Sometimes we see unexplainable peaks in your time series. We need to deal with them, but let's deal with the earthquake here. So we had an earthquake, a major earthquake. Uh, half of Christchurch was laid in ruins. And what happened? The water mains burst. 
there was no running water. You you'd open your water faucet, there was nothing coming out. So what did people do? They went to the supermarket and bought bottled water because you need water to survive and to wash and brush your teeth. And so we saw a huge spike in sales of bottled waters. And then again, later on for a second earthquake and that kind of decayed over time as the water mains were repaired and people actually returned to bathing, not with in bottled water, but in the water that actually came out of the faucets. So you see how that went down here. Now we needed to forecast that. Well, we, we did a couple of things. Of course, we set in Boolean markers that said something happened here and then uh, either forecast, I don't exactly know what we did here, but for instance, we could have done a, could have uh, hypothesized a decaying function here, or we could just have said, okay, we put in a, 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 a structural change marker and trust it in the adaptivity that we also have uh, to capture this slow decay here, would have worked out pretty well. And well, earthquakes, that's the one catastrophe. And the other catastrophe is the one that we all have in, have experienced in the recent past. That's a, the pandemic, that's the COVID-19 pandemic that we have. And of course, it has had a major impact on retail sales and on goods availability. And everybody may have their very own story about toilet paper uh, running out and empty shelves and rationing and whatever. This here is a type of washing powder or detergent. And what we see here is the actual sales, the past sales in red and sometimes in black. That's color, that's data points that we removed by the outlier correction or because we were out of stock there. But for all intents and purposes, those are sales. And then at some point in time, the first lockdowns happened in this particular country. And so we had different types of lockdowns of different severity. We see how um, in the third one here and the uh, in this uh, pinkish one, suddenly sales peaked up again. It may have been that people were allowed to go shopping and they said, wonderful, finally we get to buy some detergent again. Mm -hmm. And then more lockdowns and so on and so forth. And at some point in time, the question was, how do we forecast out for the new year? So that was a couple of months ago. And there, there's really a question here. How do we deal with that? What do we expect once the lockdowns end? Do we expect this to be the new normal? Perhaps people don't really need to wash their clothes so much because they're all working from home in pajamas anyway, so no need to look nice. Or an alternative is that people may nowadays uh, bundle their, their shopping, uh, where, whereas before COVID they would go to five different stores and get something here and something there and something over there because they just got whatever at each stores at that whatever they, that store would where would the, that store would have a nice assortment or low prices and then during COVID they would say I'd rather only go to one store and get everything there and so all the other stores had a bit of a problem and that one store may even on certain assortments have seen higher sales and we don't know how it's going to continue and that's part of the art of retail forecasting. And actually, all these little dots down here, you may be wondering about what are, what are those? Are those just, just artifacts? I hope nobody is buying a new monitor already because they think they have their monitor is broken. No, those are different promotions. Those are Boolean markers for all the different kinds of promotions that I was talking about. Another thing that uh, kind of puzzles all of us is litter boxes. So those are uh, the little boxes that you put your cat in uh, or the cat will, will visit it uh, by itself if it's well trained. And we saw that in this particular store, the sales of litter, it was a larger warehouse type of supermarket. So those are not grocery products, those are durable goods. And those sales actually went up during COVID. <laughs> Either people didn't want to let their cats out where they could be, they could catch COVID or whatever, or people stayed at home and finally noticed that uh, Kitty's litter box was not quite as nice anymore and that Kitty would certainly profit from a new litter box. And in this case, probably makes more sense to let these Boolean markers stop at some point in time because at some point in time, all the kitties in the world do have their new litter boxes and they will not be uh, replaced quite as often. So at some point in time, we'll go back to a new normal to pre-COVID. And as I said, there is some, some art involved here. So, 
some of the challenges that we have in retail forecasting, one of the challenges is really the mass data, the sheer amount of data that we have here. So just a back of the envelope calculation, a typical supermarket, a medium sized supermarket will have anything between 10 and 20,000 stock keeping units. If you're a discounter, then you have only 1000 SKUs because you only have one type of flower and not five different brands. If you have only one type of flower, not five, then you have far fewer SKUs on the shelves. It makes life easier. But a typical supermarket may have 20,000 SKUs. If you're a large, a hypermarket, then you may have up to 100,000 or more. You may have 1,000 stores, and that's just a good size to larger retailer, but not one of the really big ones. The big ones have tens of thousands of stores. You may have multiple years worth of history, if, if, if you're lucky, if not, then not. You have all these different promotion types. You may have basket data, although I don't really see it all that often. You may have other influencing data. If you have weather impact, then you need the weather for each store, for each separate store. So an enormous amount of, of time series, only 20, just 20 million time series that may need to be forecasted every single day. If you're replenishing every day, then you need a forecast for the next days that is that is there every single day. You may not want to refit your model every day, so you can do something in terms of, of uh, being smart about remodeling, but still you need a forecast maybe every single day. And the forecasts need to be fast. People don't want to wait and you may have a critical time window for replenishment. So the store may close at eight o'clock in the evening. You may need your orders at 10 p.m. to arrive in the, uh, in the next morning because between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. the distribution center will fill up the truck. So they need to know how much to product to ship to which store. And the forecasts also need to be fast in case you need those forecasts for promotion planning. If you plan on a promotion and you twiddle around, OK, maybe I want to include this product in the promotion. And so you need to have a, an updated forecast for the entire promotion, including all interaction effects for the entire promotion by adding just one product. Or maybe, OK, I want to include this product here, but I want to put a coupon on that. So you only can you need to have, to have that coupon that I'm going to push out on the on the mobile app. So how does that impact the forecast? You'll typically have lower sales if you have a condition like a coupon. So you need to, to update your forecasts very quickly. Um, so we really have big data. And uh, the other thing here is that not only do we have a lot of data, we also need extreme robustness and exception handling. Because if you have 20 million time series every, every single day and just one thousandth of them is broken in some way, then that's 20,000 time series every single day. And uh, one thing that I've uh, learned over the years is that our customers, the retailers, they're very good at finding the very few broken forecasts. And if those are broken badly enough, in terms of you, you'll sell 10 or 20 units, but because of some problem with the forecasts or with the data, suddenly you get a forecast of 200. Well, if that slips through without being caught and suddenly you have 200 units on the shelf, uh, which is far too much, you may not even have the space to store it and you have a major problem. And if that happens only one out of 1000 times years, it's still a lot. So you need to be robust to the tune of really Six Sigma. You really don't want this one error in thousand. You may only be allowed one major error in a million or 10 million, then you only have two problems a day to deal with. Still, one problem every single day or two. So really need extreme robustness. Forecasting methods. So what kind of forecasting methods can we use in retail? So there's a classical forecasting or time series methods that we all learn that even is going to talk about in demand forecasting with R, like arena autoregressive moving average. Everybody knows that one, it's a mainstay. Or exponential smoothing, the entire zoo of exponential smoothing methods. Regression-based approaches like classical linear, ordinary least squares approaches, yeah. Or some kind of mixed effect or Poisson or negative binomial regression, which probably makes more sense for, a, for retail forecasting on a store times day times skew basis because we have really have count data down there and the, yeah, the, the normal error distribution for classical OLS doesn't really make sense anymore. You may have Bayesian methods in here, which is uh, nice, which is something I like. 
or of course machine learning methods um, with neural networks or the deeper version deep learning methods xj boost which came out on top really in the m5 competition gonna talk about that in a few minutes or random forests or few uh, people doing random forests for retail forecasting i especially like them because they make for so pretty pictures okay and why where are the problems in retail or why don't all of these work so for instance arima yeah you can model the causal effects like promotions and uh, similar things with arimax or with a regression with arima errors you can do that but uh, selecting the model is really non-trivial because you have to search through multiple problems and then select by ike or something similar you may have missing data and um, for instance, you may have a product that's only available seasonally. So each summer it's not listed, it's not available. You have a missing period somewhere in between. What do you do with that? Arima really wants to look back a couple of periods. That's the autoregressive moving average part. And if it can't look back because where it looks, there is nothing there, so there's no data, it has kind of a problem here. The multiple seasonalities are really hard, especially for Arima. And remember those overlapping seasonalities, intra weekly seasonalities and intra yearly seasonalities and tomatoes can't really deal with that in arima exponential smoothing yeah we used to do that for instance you can in principle add a couple of more components you have add you have level of trend and season in, in as a standard components you can add promotional components and practice once you have multiple promotional effects like multiple different types of promotions or different tactics it turns into a bookkeeping nightmare and it's it gets unstable. You can deal with missing data in some way, but it's again hard. They cannot really handle metric causals like prices or temperatures. If you deal with those in the context of exponential smoothing, then you're very soon in a state space framework or regression based approach, and then you're moving farther and farther away from exponential smoothing. Machine learning. Yeah, of course, everybody's talking about machine learning. Some people actually don't attend this presentation because they're teaching a course on machine learning. I recommend that they just stream this presentation, but haven't heard back from them. Problem with machine learning is that it's still black boxes and it will always be. It's just, well, it's machine learning. It's artificial intelligence. It's as much a black box as our brains are. Nobody can look into our brains either. No, not even ourselves. And if we say this, so, then we're lying to ourselves. So people would really like to understand why the forecast is 15 today. Or if you get some of those broken forecasts that I was talking about, why is it broken? Where exactly does the brokenness come from? How can we fix it? How can we make sure it doesn't pop up again tomorrow or the day after? Or you may want to tweak it in specific ways. How can I deal with the, the fact that I'm underestimating on specific days or in specific situations or specific promotions? That's it's, it's really hard and explaining real AI here is useful but it's it's still hard and of course exponential smoothing or regression based approaches do that automatically and it's actually pretty simple one other thing to keep in mind is that, yeah we already saw this picture those were the tomatoes uh, tomatoes per day of week and one thing i'd like to draw your attention to it here is just take a look at those box plots that are superimposed and how they are of different sizes right on saturday the box block is far wider than on monday tuesday wednesday and same for the bean plots that are behind the dots so the it's not only that mean sales go up that we have this hockey stick on average sales or in the median that's a thick black line the other thing that we have is that the variance increases Right? On Saturday, the variance is far higher than uh, during the rest of the week. And that is a problem because we need quantile forecasts for replenishment. When we want to decide how much product to put in the store, a expectation forecast is not enough because if we expect to sell 200 kilograms of tomatoes and, and we put in 200 kilograms, but 250 kilograms want to be sold, and um, well, that may be enough on Monday through Thursday, but on Saturday, we're going to again run out of stock in the middle of the morning, and then we'll have tons of very unhappy client customers. You may recall that picture at the very beginning. So we really need to deal with quantile forecasts and heteroscedasticity. And the other point where this comes in really is promotions. If you have a promotion, then promotions not only increase average sales, but they have much more of an impact on the high quantile. So the variance in promotion again increases dramatically and we really need to deal with that because 
Perhaps you don't even want to have the same service level in promotions as outside promotions. If perhaps outside promotions, you want a 95% service level, but if you aim for the same service level in a promotion, then perhaps you, you, you will usually have stock left over at the end of the promotion and that clogs your shelves or your back room or you need to sell it off at markdowns. Nobody wants that. You have to deal with that. And you really need good quanta forecasts for all kinds of situations. Here's our tomatoes just zooming into the, uh, the, the holdout sample where we actually where we have the, the expectation forecast. That's this darker red line. The actual sales in the holdout sample are the black are the gray dots. And then we have multiple quanta forecasts. Don't ask me about the specific levels that we have up here. And we see how the this difference between the expectation and the quantile, uh, that's essentially the safety amount that we put on top of the expectation to cover for the for the variability. Now we see how this safety amount is much lower on Monday at the beginning of the week and much higher on Saturday at the end of the week. And here you see why it's so useful that this store is closed on Sundays because now we see the these fish hooks or hockey sticks for each week separately because on Sunday we don't have any data points. All right, let's talk about the M5 forecasting competition. That's the most recent of the Macrodacus forecasting competition. And this one was, of course, extremely important and interesting for us because that actually used retail data, Walmart data, Walmart, the giant retailer in the US. So very interesting for us. What can we learn from that? And there is going to be an upcoming special issue on the IJF on that. And so there's a shameless self-promotion. I'll have a commentary paper in there. Still need to write that up. OK, what can we learn from that? The first thing to keep in mind is that Walmart is not a typical retailer. Now, not only are they the, the biggest and baddest and hugest retailer, the other thing is that they are they have few promotions. They have more or less an everyday low price strategy. Yes, of course, they do run promotions every now and then at markdowns, certainly, but other retailers are far more promotion driven. So at Walmart, the M5 data, they had prices but they didn't really have this entire zoo of different promotions and different tactics and ways of drawing attention to certain products that can have a huge impact. So the question really is, will the results that we see in the M5, will they generalize to promotions? And just yesterday, I talked to one of our customers and I was banging my head against my desk at the, at the utter data quality issues that we have, especially in promotions. So yeah, kind of questionable. We all found it interesting that the winner was a South Korean student with uh, pretty much zero forecasting training. It was a, apparently a regular Kaggle contributor, and uh, but he, he won this forecasting competition without apparently ever having taken a forecasting course and left everybody who had forecasting experience in that. So that kind of led to some soul searching among the forecasters. So I don't know what to make of that. Um, most of the top submissions used XJ boost, so a boosting uh, approach uh, seems to be strong, but of course it's hard to interpret. Uh, and going back to what I was talking about, if XJ boost gives you one bad forecast and your retailer wants wants to know where this comes from, how we can make sure this doesn't recur, how do we do that? Hard. One thing that kind of didn't really that didn't draw a lot of attention that I found intriguing was that only 7.5% of the submissions outperformed exponential smoothing at the bottom, at the lowest level of the hierarchy, and then simple bottom-up aggregating. So it's pretty much the simplest thing that you can do in forecasting. Just run it through forecast ETS and let that automatically find a model and forecast out, and then take those forecasts at the very bottom and aggregate them up. Extremely simple. And 92.5% of these submissions didn't outperform that. Now, of course, I assume that many people just submitted the first thing they did and then kind of abandoned the entire competition. We'll never know why this happened. But honestly, as a retailer, I would be looking at that and thinking, well, either I can buy like 10 PhDs and pay them tons of money and they only have a 7.5% chance of outperforming an extremely simple method that I can probably implement in a fraction of the cost. It's intriguing, really. So it, again, it kind of underscores the uh, the power of the very simple methods. 
And of course, that really doesn't come out uh, a lot because Spiris Makrodak is very reasonably focused on the top 50 submissions, not on the 92.5% that did not perform exponential smoothing. The uncertainty benchmarks, uh, they were really not appropriate for a low volume count series because they used, again, ARIMA, ex um, exponential smoothing and so on and so forth. And those really rely on uh, normal errors, normally distributed errors. And as I mentioned a couple of slides back, in retail at the bottom, uh, we have low volume count data, zeros, ones and twos. So I reran the analysis here with what I think are more appropriate benchmarks like Poisson distributions and regressions and stuff like that. And I'm kind of surprised that actually it didn't outperform ARIMA. So this was a criticism that I had and kind of figure out that the criticism didn't really hold a lot of water and that ARIMA was better than I thought. I'm going to write that up in that little commentary of mine. Uh, finally, yeah, well, we have better forecasts, but what does that mean at the end of the day? Does that translate into monetary benefits? Do we have better stocks at the end of the day? If you look at the differences in quality, and they're really small at the top, and yeah, and subsequent decisions, if we're talking about replenishment, uh, then we have to, uh, to replenish in certain pack sizes. So I always say, if you have zero stock on hand, and one forecast tells you you're going to sell 3.7 units and the other one says no you're going to sell 5.2 units and actual demand is six when the second forecast is better more accurate than the first one but if you can, if you can only replenish in pack sizes of eight so you either put nothing there or a pack of eight units of eight bottles of shampoo then both forecasts will lead to the exact same decision of replenishing one pack of eight so it doesn't really matter that the second forecast was more accurate than the first one. And there is some literature that's, uh, that kind of posits a direct link between forecast improvements and better stocks. And if you really look at those papers, they're not applicable to supermarket replenishment because there's stuff like uh, airplane spare parts. Yeah, well, high price, very low demand. It's kind of different than bottles of shampoo that you replenish in packs of eight. So it's the link between forecast accuracy and actual stock positions is not that strong. So bottom line, last slide. How do we forecast for retail? So don't really look to standard forecasting techniques, although in the M5 competition, Arima did a pretty good job, but I'd say that is partly due to the fact that Walmart is not a big typical retailer. I personally really like regression based approaches. They're causal, they're explainable, they're fast, they're reasonably robust. Consider some kind of regularization simply because you have this enormous zoo of causal factors that you need to feed into your model and every practitioner will think feeding more explanatory variables into the model will automatically improve matters. Well, not necessarily unless you regularize. It's good to understand the predictive distribution and when you need an expectation forecast versus a quantile forecast. For instance, if you do promotion planning, then you need an expectation forecast. Where do I expect to sell the most? What's the for what's the promotions that I want to that I expect to have the highest payoff? And then subsequently you need replenishment. Yeah, you need a quantile forecast. Expect to spend a lot of time and effort cleaning your data because it's incredible what kind of data you see out there. And I think that's not specific to retail, but it still it needs to be kept in mind. It's always good to understand the bigger picture, the processes that consume our forecasts, so the logistical rounding, the order optimization, the promotion optimization. It's always good to think hard about how to assess the forecast quality because MAPES and mean absolute errors may be misleading at lower level granularities because fun things happen down there. It's always good to have a good report with business users, whether you're an in-house forecaster at a retailer or a consultant or a software vendor. It's good if the people that actually use your forecast, if they trust you and if they take you seriously and sometimes they don't do that and always think it's kind of a pity and a lost opportunity. All right, uh, so that was a little more than half half an hour. Thank you everybody for your attention. I hope you're still online, all of you. If there is any questions, then I'll be happy to answer. I actually have tons and tons of slides in the backup and I didn't even talk about fashion forecasting and about the data issues that are in there. So if you have any questions on that, I'm going to inflict some more slides on you. Okay, thank you, Ivan, back to you. Thank you very, thank much, you very much, Stefan. Stefan.
Great presentation as always, very enjoyable. Uh, we have a, a lot of questions and I will select uh, those that uh, that seem to be slightly more popular. So the first one, uh, how do you monitor cannibal cannibalization? Uh, the person says that uh, in fast moving consumer goods market, it is a difficult task. It must be even harder you know, when it comes to retail. Yeah, uh, that is a wonderful question. And I, I, I sometimes wish our customers were uh, knew enough about forecasting about retail to ask actually ask that question because I, yeah, yeah, cannibalization is an extremely hard topic. It's it's there. I'm sure it's there, but it's always extremely hard to to monitor because there's, yeah, if you have uh, one product on promotion and that may have an impact on other products and the uplift on this one product gets the cannibalization effect kind of uh, dissipates and is distributed across multiple cannibalized products. So the signal gets weaker and weaker uh, for the cannibalized products and same for halo and complementarity effects. I think there is no fully automated way of doing this and it always comes down to a lot of manual work or at least smart automatic work. If you just put everything into a machine learning methods and tell it to find the cannibalization effects and you get all kinds of spurious effects. I once did that just for fun and found a strong cannibalization effect of spark plugs. If spark plugs were on promotion, then sales of honey went down. That kind of served to show how useless it was. So you actually needed to show that, okay, if one brand of spark plugs is on promotion, then other brands of spark plugs will go down. You actually need to include the product uh, hierarchy and the categories that are involved. So it's very, it comes down to very good um, uh, basic data that you have. And then you can do stuff like adding in Boolean predictors on one product if a cannibalizing product is on sale and adding in uh, priors if you have a Bayesian model and stuff like that. So different ways of doing this. And I'm not saying that I have that we have really solved this problem. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Stefan. Uh, I think we have Robert with us and uh, he might be able to ask a question in person. So Robert, you can unmute yourself. Well, as ever, Stefan, a stimulating uh, talk uh, and uh, large areas of agreement. So I'll, I'll try and find some area where we, we may have a, a sort of different approach anyway. You're trying to do yourself and for that matter me out of a job in your last comments about um, accuracy being not translatable into financial benefits. And yet you, I, pretty well everybody uh, in the forecasting world says, well, we need more accurate forecasting. So uh, broadly accepting your comment, how could I not about pack sizes and the complexities of distribution networks and, uh, and so on. How do we uh, make the argument convincingly for the value of improved forecasting? Well, I would say that um, perhaps I should take myself with a grain of salt and perhaps everybody else should so you should so too. Um, in, in the great mass of products, improved forecasts really do not matter all that much. And I'm also thinking of the, uh, the vast long tail of slow moving products that you only sell once per week and that's not even extremely slow moving. Well, if you just sold one of these units, you have two on the shelf, uh, then you just replenish one unit the next time the truck rolls around. So it's and improving the forecast to 1.1 or 0 0.9 per week doesn't really make a difference. But some of these products, when they come into a promotion and they then they suddenly turn into fast movers. And then it's extremely important to figure out whether in promotion you're going to sell 10 or 20 units, because if you sell 20 and you replenish for 20, then you just then you're left at the end of the promotion with stock for another 10 weeks. And if you have a demand of 20 and you forecast it 10, then you have unsatisfied demand and people are unhappy. So I would say that the forecast accuracy starts to matter during high season or during promotions. And that's where things get interesting and where bad forecasts can actually be, be very painful. Thank you. Uh, back to the questions that we have Q&A. Uh, one of the participants is saying that uh, whether as a demand influencing factor, it seems to be doing a very good job uh, in intraday forecasting. 
Uh, but uh, from their experience, when it comes to long term, it doesn't do as well. So have you encountered cases when it would be relevant for long term forecasting? Yeah, weather. I'll, I'll take this opportunity to kind of kind of digress because uh, because I can essentially weather. Everybody would like to include the weather in their forecasts, but uh, there's multiple problems here. And one problem is that you need you know, when you have a promotion, you know what kind of promotion is going to come up next week because you set the promotion. It's an intervention variable. The weather, we're not quite as far as setting the weather ourselves, so we need to take what we get and we need to forecast the weather. And weather forecasts as such uh, can only be done with any skill about 10 days ahead, with any skill, and even then they're usually off. And so the question really is, uh, will our noisy weather forecasts really improve our demand forecasts, given that the link between the weather and the demand is also not straightforward? So there is one problem with the weather. And if we want to take uh, the short term weather forecasts, well, then we have the problem. Will we still be able to deal to do anything? Is there you know, time enough to influence anything? If we're writing this evening orders for a supermarket that will arrive the day after tomorrow, then we actually need a forecast for at least two days ahead for the day after tomorrow or even later. Tomorrow's forecasts will not weather forecasts will not help us anymore because we can't influence the stock position for tomorrow in the store anymore. So one point where this might be useful is if, if you're a butcher in the store and you see weather is fine, well, I'm going to cut up some sides of beef that make for a good barbecue meat. And then that's a very short term forecast that will probably be useful. And those are really included in not in a systematic way and probably well enough. Mm -hmm. A uh, related question to this is from John Boylan. Uh, in your experience, how similar are these impact of causal factors across different locations of stores? Well, that's actually interesting. That's one of the a, a discussion I had yesterday with a customer. Uh, they have larger stores, mega stores, and smaller supermarkets. So it's all grocery. And what they were talking about was they, they set promotions centrally. So they define which promotions are going to come up and they supply the, the, uh, the data to the cash registers about changed prices and they advertise the promotions in their newsletter or their app and so on and so forth. Fair enough. And they, of course, mainly have their mega stores in mind because those are Big and you kind of think of them when you think of this particular retailer. But the vast mass of small stores, they're small and they don't even have the room to do secondary placements or end caps for everything that's on promotions. We may have 20 products and promotions, I'm oversimplifying, but you may only have five aisles, so only 10 end caps. So you have to decide which of the which 10 of the 20 products you need to put on promotion in the store. And depending on which they are, that means that a promotion on a given product may end up in an end cap in one week and five weeks later, same product and promotion. It may not end up in an end cap because other products are in promotion. So the same kind of promotion in the system may have a very consistent uplift in the mega stores because in the mega stores, the promotion is always put on an end cap because we have enough room. And then in the small stores, sometimes it's in the end cap and sometimes it's not in the end cap. So sometimes it has a strong uplift because people see it in the store and sometimes the same promotion has a very small uplift because people don't see that the product is in promotion. So in this case, it's the store format that matters, small stores versus large stores. And of course, a similar thing, if you have a supermarket, a retailer supermarket, and one of the stores is next to a school and then the other one is somewhere out in the middle of, at the end, outskirts of town, in one store, uh, the promotion that, are, that work well are those that the school children can take advantage of and the other promotions are uh, the ones, uh, the, the promotions that are interesting for the store at the outskirts of town, that's the promotions for, uh, well, people stocking up for the entire family that go there by car. So it's the location that matters. So actually, sometimes these promotions, these causes do have quite differential impact. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what I thought, to be honest. <laughs> uh, sort of related question, do you treat different groups of SKUs differently, like using different modeling techniques and so on? And if yes, how would you group SKUs? 
Well, actually, we try to kind of put all our eggs in the same basket and then make sure it's a really good basket. So essentially, we're, we're trying to build one big model that can account for everything and that needs minimal tweaking and then concentrate on making that model as good as possible. That said, uh, we do treat perishables slightly differently than non-perishables. So perishables are the kind of products with short shelf lives. So think fruit, vegetables, fresh meat, um, dairy, possibly flowers, newspapers, and so on and so forth. So products simply don't have a long shelf life. Uh, what's different about them? You know, one difference is they often have a pretty strong seasonality, which other products may not have. They have much smaller promotional impacts because you can't store them. If you have a promotion on olive oil, high price product, you can buy and stock up on that for the next couple of months. If you have a promotion on strawberries, well, you can of course buy strawberries, make strawberry pie and, and freeze that, but actually the impact, the uplift on strawberries is not gonna be quite as strong. That makes a bit of a difference here because they allow for more seasonality in perishables and for durable items or longer shelf life items and for lower impacts of the of the promotion. And of course for perishables, um, since they're perishable, the retailer has an incentive not to put too much stock on the shelves. It's usually better for strawberries if uh, you go out of stock shortly before closing rather than have something left over because what you'll have left over in strawberries, you can't sell that the next day, so you have to throw it away. So anything you're not selling is an immediate write-off, so you'd rather not have enough product on the shelf. So we need to account for the fact that our demand that we are seeing is censored in perishables. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a difference. And then other things that we're not really doing quite as uh, well as I would like to is so-called job lot quantities. So if you're in a do-it-yourself retailer, Home Depot or similar, um, not saying that I'm talking about exactly this uh, retailer, but yeah, home improvement stores. If you're remodeling your house and you want new light switches, then you really want all the light switches in the house to be all of the same make because you don't want different light switches in different rooms of the house. So you go to your do-it-yourself retailer and you buy 20, 30, 40 light switches, all the same kind. So once uh, in, the, in the sales time series, you see a sudden sale of 30 units and then it's again zero because usually people don't buy light switches. And then later on, somebody else comes in and buys 20 units. And then later on, another one comes in, buys 25 units. So we have hugely lumpy demands in these job lot quantities. And that's really a bit of a challenge, especially in terms of stock control, because if we just did a mean forecast and would say, well, yep, on average, we're selling five units per week and there is a certain variance. So the quantile would be nine. You need to have nine on stock. And the next time somebody comes in and wants to buy 25, nine is not going to be enough for them. They don't want to put in nine and say, well, the rest will not have any light switches. They want 25. So, and again, uh, turning it around, it's not the it's not like uh, the customer really wants to order ahead of time because light switches and they're not that expensive. It's it's okay for the retailer to have 25, 30, 40 on stock. It's fine. It's just that you need to to have enough product on hand here. And I'm not even talking about the 90th quantile of all data points, but about the 90th quantile of observed sales here. So job lot quantities are another special topic here. Mm. Interesting. Well, you, you've started it. So the next question is related to this. Uh, what is your go to model as well as metric for evaluation of uh, intermittent and lumpy time series? OK, yeah, uh, the lumpy. <laughs> well, in general, we have a regression based Bayesian approach with um, yeah, where we can just feed in all the causals as predictors and it's a pretty open architecture and we can feed in tons of things and the user can feed in information and can do a lot of things here and you can actually still understand what's happening. We're using this regression for all kinds. It has a Poisson and negative binomial, no actually Poisson yeah, aspects and and continuous aspect so it's it's a um, it's a wild beast actually so we um, and this works reasonably enough for fast moving products and slow moving products and i'll be honest not quite as well as i would like it to for the lumpy demand so those are still a bit of a challenge here but we're um, we're trying to do our best 
In terms of accuracy measurement, well, my personal favorite is the mean squared error and perhaps the root mean squared error or a scaled version if you want to compare it against time series, uh, across time series, uh, simply because everything else, the mean absolute error, the maze, the weighted MAPE and so on, those are lead to biased forecasts. And uh, that's another thing that I'd like to pontificate on and uh, that I wrote papers on and so on and so forth. So, and there is there's this always this problem if you have the mean absolute error and you're forecasting an intermittent product that has more than half zeros, then your best forecast as measured by the mean absolute error is a flat zero forecast. So very strongly biased and similar things happen for other things. So I'd rather not use the mean absolute error. I like the mean squared error and make this comparable. The problem always is that when we're talking to potential or actual customers and there is only uh, we have only limited scope in deciding on the accuracy measurement so usually a potential customer comes in and asks for for a forecasting competition on their data and then they specify the error measure and then we well we may not give the expectation forecast if they're measuring on weighted MAPE then we know well the expectation forecast will be unbiased or so we hope but it's not going to look good on weighted MAPE. So we adapt it to give a weight, weighted MAPE optimal forecast. I'm not, I don't think that is cheating per se because there you get what you pay for. And actually, if they then decide to go with us and we do give them good quantile forecasts, but weighted MAPE doesn't assess good quantile forecasts that they need later on. Mm -hmm. Stefan, could I, uh, Ivan, could I make a, a comment and link to that? And this links to one of the questions in the uh, Q&A as well about Walmart good supply chain and therefore a shorter term forecast. Another, another aspect of the evaluation is, is the lead time. The, um, the M5 competition does not discuss lead time. It's also got a hierarchy in. So you're getting a very, I would say, distorted view about what's directly relevant. I, I'm not arguing against the, the, the value and the learning in that. So uh, there is a need, I think, to focus very directly on lead time effects as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, now, for instance, uh, things like trend. Do you include a trend or not? And that is, of course, becomes more and more relevant uh, the farther out you forecast. If you're forecasting for replenishment, which we is our main focus, but not only only focus, then your forecast needs to go out for about two weeks in a store. If you're in the distribution center, you need to go out for a couple of months. But what some of our customers also do is they will uh, calculate long term forecasts and already start sharing Christmas demand forecasts with their suppliers in early summer. So perhaps not right now, but in two months, they're going to talk about uh, the Christmas sales that they expect with their with their suppliers, and of course, they need long term forecasts for those. Yeah, and it all uh, comes down to what lead time you're you're thinking of. Uh, completely correct about that. Right, uh, we're running out of time. We have so many questions, and unfortunately, we cannot uh, ask all of them. Maybe Stefan can respond in on his uh, LinkedIn profile or something like that. So we need to wrap up uh, and uh, let me ask you a couple very brief questions. Maybe you can answer uh, quickly. Why even try forecasting uh, an earthquake effect if earthquakes are rare and unpredictable? I think this is interesting. Great question. No, we don't want to forecast the earthquake effect. What we do want to do in this case is take out the earthquake effect so we don't mistakenly assume this is something seasonal and will recur next week, next year at the same time. Same for COVID. If you have a product that's only been listed for one year, it's very hard to say what is seasonality and what is a one-off effect. And if we have the earthquake and we believe that is seasonal, whoops, going to forecast huge sales again next week. So it's more a question of data cleansing than of forecasting. And of course, there's other catastrophes uh, like hurricanes in Florida, um, where you can actually forecast when the hurricane is going to make landfall and you need to include that in your forecasts for dry ice and for, uh, for wooden boards to board up your house and so on and so forth. So it really depends on whether you have to forecast or cleanse. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. The last question, very short one. What's your favorite distribution? My favorite distribution is the neckbin. I love ne negative binomials. 
<laughs> great. Thank you very much, Stefan. It was a great presentation. Thank you for answering all the questions. And thanks, everyone, for joining us and attending this uh, event. In two weeks, we will have a, another one, hopefully. So stay tuned and keep in touch. See you all. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stefan.